Uh, no, I mean, if you have further questions, you can put your questions into the chat window and Asgar will be taking it. So for the interest of time, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, which will be Edmund Chow from Georgia Tech. Thanks, Victor. Uh, let me try to share my screen. So is the sound okay? Uh, yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a new algorithm for rapidly computing the Kula matrix. And this is joint that I've done with two of my previous students, Xin Xing and Hua Huang. Xin has actually graduated and um, and working with Lin Lin at, at Berkeley, and Hua Zak is still uh, working on other things with me at Georgia Tech. Okay, so this talk is about a method for constructing a hierarchical matrix representation of the unfolded ERI tensor. So the electron repulsion integral tensor unfolded into a matrix. Um, and on the right over here is a typical picture of a hierarchical, an H2 hierarchical matrix. The uh, colored blocks are low rank blocks, possibly of different ranks and of different ranks and different sizes. And these uh, white blocks are blocks that are uh, dense. They're stored in dense form. They're, so they're not, they're not in low rank and, they're, and so they're stored in dense form. Okay, so once we have a H2 hierarchical matrix, we can compute matrix vector products with it very rapidly. And this means that we can, uh, in linear time, so rapidly in linear time, in linear time compute the Coulomb matrix. Okay, so this is obviously related to the continuous fast multiple method. But the advantage here, when we use this uh, H2 hierarchical matrix representation is that it can compress many more interactions than CFMM. So many fewer of these uh, white blocks. And since the number of these white blocks is the bottleneck in CFMM, this makes the matrix vector multiplication in, um, in uh, the H2 format much more rapid. But I think even more importantly, it means that the ERI tensor can be stored in a way, in, in just a modest amount of memory. So even compared to density fitting, um, it can store, let's say, five to 10 times less in, in less memory. Um, and this is because in density fitting, for instance, we're also computing a low rank approximation to the ERI matrix, but it's one low rank approximation as opposed to here, there are many low rank approximations to the blocks. Okay, so the Main advantage is storage. And if you're able to store things, then you're not, you don't need to recompute, the, recompute ERIs. Now, the really hard part here is that um, we want to compute this low rank approximation without computing most of the ERIs. So in fact, the vast majority of the ERIs we do not compute. Okay, so the naive way of doing this computation is to compute the ERI matrix, and then use an algebraic technique such as singular value decomposition uh, to compute the approximation or to compute the representation. But this can't, this is this has to be avoided primarily because using algebraic techniques such as SVDs is just too too expensive. Okay, so there is uh, some related work, and obviously anything related to CFMM in the past or related methods. Um, Ed Vileyev and his group has have proposed using a block low rank matrix for the three index tensors and density fitting. So that is very related to what we're doing. Um, we're using an H2 matrix that gives us linear time or linear complexity algorithms. And also importantly, again, not computing the entries in the uh, matrix first before compressing them. 
um, Jiefeng and uh, Le Xin have used interpolative decomposition, which is a type of which is a type of low rank approximation to approximate the ERI tensor in tensor hypercontraction form. And Dmitry Lyak has a coupled cluster method that is inspired by hierarchical matrices. Okay, so to uh, put everything in context, let me go back to FMM and also CFMM. In classical FMM, the interaction between a point X and a point Y is the Coulomb kernel. Okay, so now consider two uh, sets of points that are in these separated boxes. Okay, so a set capital X and a set capital Y. The matrix K capital X capital Y is a low rank matrix when these blocks are separated. And in FMM, this low rank approximation is computed using a degenerate approximation of the kernel function. So here's this R term degenerate approximation of the kernel function. And once we have this degenerate approximation, we can write down the low rank approximation to this low rank block K directly just by evaluating these functions G and these functions H at the points X and at the points Y. And in particular, we don't evaluate anything um, that are pairs of points X and Y, okay? And in FMM, the degenerate approximation is computed using multiple expansions. So in particular, we don't need to compute any of these entries in this matrix K to come up with the approximation. And this is called an algebraic, sorry, this is called an analytic technique. And in contrast, the algebraic technique such as SVD would compute this matrix K and then apply SVD. SVD um, would give you better approximation or the same approximation with lower rank because it is optimal, but um, it is a lot more expensive to compute. Okay, so now um, in CFMM, the interaction here is between two continuous distributions. So assuming Gaussian type functions for the continuous uh, distributions rather than between points, okay? And what I'm illustrating here is the interaction between continuous distributions centered in one box that are separated from continuous distributions in another box, meaning that the boxes are separated, okay? So here's, um, the set of distributions, called the, capital, the capital phi is the set of distributions in one box, capital theta is the set of distributions in the other box. And this notation is the ERI um, matrix block, okay? So this is the ERI matrix block associated with these two sets of points. And this is also a low rank, a low rank matrix that we want to compute for, this is also a low rank block and we want to compute the low rank approximation. Okay. And um, again, CFMM uses the multiple expansion like FMM, as long as the extents of these distributions do not overlap. So these circles represent where the Gaussian functions are numerically non-zero. So if these extents do not overlap, then we can use a multiple expansion. But in this case, where the extents are larger. So for instance, if we have diffuse spaces functions, then we cannot use the multiple expansion in this case, okay? And what CFMM does is that we uh, have to assume that we have to just compute the interactions directly. Okay, so that these would correspond to those white blocks in that hierarchical matrix that I showed before. So we call that the, the near field interactions. However, it could be uh, unintuitive that the ERI block in this case is actually still low rank. We just don't have a way of computing it. Okay, so, so the number of interactions that must be computed directly in CFMM is very large because of the large number of boxes or pairs of boxes in which there, there are overlapping extents. Okay, and these near field interactions dominate the costs of CFMM. Okay, but many of these blocks, these ERI blocks involving low overlapping extents are actually low rank. 
And the problem is that we do not have an efficient way to compute these low rank factorizations. And that is what this talk is about, a way of trying to compute these low rank approximations without, again, without computing the elements and applying some algebraic methods. Okay, so as an illustration that these blocks are actually low rank, here's just a simple experiment. It's a 3D experiment, but these are 2D pictures to try to show you what's going on. Okay, so we're going to have two boxes and uh, 600 randomly distributed um, spherical Gaussian functions in each box, okay? And these distributions all have, um, are parameterized by this exponent P. So we can, we can look at this case where the, the Gaussians are very narrow to Gaussians that are very diffuse. Okay, so there's, here's the case of P equals 10, Lambda is the radius of the extent. Here is P equals one, you see it have overlapping. So this is handled well by, on the left case, this is handled well by CFMM. This cannot be handled, uh, computed uh, using multiple expansions. So what we're gonna do is to look at the ERI block. So this ERI block and plot its singular values and see how fast these singular values decay. Okay, and we're gonna plot the singular values from largest to the smallest. There are 600 of them, but we're gonna plot the first 300. And that's this dotted line, okay? And this first case is the very narrow Gaussians. And for comparison, we're going to plot the singular values for um, this kernel matrix block using the Coulomb kernel. And since the boxes are separated, then by assumption, these are low rank, um, low rank blocks. So you can see that uh, in this very narrow case, the singular values fall off almost identically. Um, as we increase the uh, extent, okay, so we decrease the exponent and we increase the extent, the singular values continue to draw drop off very rapidly, similar to if we were using the Coulomb kernel. So, so we can say that this is also, so this is also low rank block for uh, P equals one, P equals 0 0.1 and also P equals 0 0.01. And in fact, for P equals 0 0.01, the singular values fall off even more rapidly than if we were using the Coulomb kernel. And that's a little bit surprising, but it does make sense because in those in these cases, the Gaussian functions are very, very flat, right? So there's very little information in the uh, Gaussian functions in these boxes. And this is why the rank is actually even smaller than you would expect, okay? So only in this case could we compress the interaction, compress the, uh, this block using CFMM uh, even though in the other cases, we also have low rank approximations. But this also shows that it, it looks like that only the centers, not the extents matter for, for low rank. The extents matter for how we compute the approximations, but um, we're gonna try to compute approximations for these guys um, as well, where, as well compared to CFMM. Okay, so how do we construct these hierarchical matrices? Okay, so, uh, what we do is we divide space recursively uh, into boxes. So um, here is all of space. So this is a one dimensional example. So there are points that are not drawn but points in this one dimensional space. And capital I is the set of all distributions. Okay, so the set of all distributions is split up into two sets, one and two. Okay, and then set one is split up into uh, sets three and four. And I with the subscripts indicates these subsets. So this also gives us a notation for the subblocks of the ERI matrix. Okay, so this is a subblock of the ERI matrix. This is a small, smaller subblock of the ERI matrix. Okay, and uh, we do this recursively until the boxes are small enough. And then we build the hierarchical matrix representation using these low rank approximations. So what is needed 
is to um, compute a low rank approximation to this off diagonal block here that I'm outlining in red. So this corresponds to um, a box seven and its interaction with the distributions or points or distributions in the box, boxes nine to 14, which are separated, spatially separated from box seven. Okay, so this is a low rank block and we wanna compute it without computing the entries of that block and without using an algebraic technique. Okay. All right, so how do we do that? Um, let me first show you what this picture looks like in 2D. So this was a 1D picture, right? So here's a picture in 2D. Uh, we have a set of, this is the domain, this is a set of points and we've divided space into a set of boxes. Okay, and uh, here is one box and maybe it is box seven, okay? And here's the union of all the boxes that are spatially separated from our box seven. So if we look at the matrix, that's this thing. So this is the same matrix that I had outlined in red before. Okay, so we wanna compute a low rank approximation to this thing, right? And the low rank approximation that we wanna compute has to take the form of an interpolative decomposition uh, in the H2 matrix case, okay? so. Uh, the notation that I'm using here is that this is K corresponding to the I, the, sorry, the seventh box, the seventh box and the off diagonal part of the seventh block. So that's what J stands for. Okay. So we want to compute an interpolative decomposition of that and the interpolative decomposition has this form. So it's a tall and skinny matrix U and for numerical stability reasons, the sizes of the entries in U has to be bounded. And a short and fat matrix K, um, where, where I superscript ID is a subset of the points in I star. So I superscript ID star is a sub, subset of the points in I star. And that means that we're going to that, that means this is, this is a subset of the columns of this matrix that we're gonna use um, to approximate the column space of this block that we want. Okay, so we wanna do this again without forming, forming this matrix. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, if the points are, if the, uh, if the points are just point charges, so not distributions, then there's an existing method called the proxy surface method. Okay, so here's the same picture of which we have a box, could be box seven, points now in this box, and then the points in the region that is separated from our central box. Okay. The idea in the proxy surface method is that we're going to take all of these points that are separated from our box and replace them by a set of proxy points. And intuitively what this means is that we want to come up with a set of proxy points that will induce an, a potential on our, in our central box that is equivalent to the potential induced by all of the other points that we're replacing. Okay, so we're, we're gonna replace all of these red points with a set of proxy points, which are these stars, which are on this boundary that's separated from our box. Okay, and then we can uh, form this new matrix, which is a much smaller matrix. So YP is a much smaller number of columns than J star because we replaced all the red points with these stars. So we form this smaller matrix and we're going to use an algebraic technique on the smaller matrix which is affordable. So we could not apply the algebraic technique to the larger matrix that we wanted the approximation to, the I star, J star. So we do apply an algebraic technique here and that gives us U and that gives us the subset of columns ID, IID. And from there, we just replace um, YP back with the points J and this is our final 
um, low rank approximation or interpolative decomposition. So you see that we haven't computed the vast majority of the points in, uh, in the matrix K in order to do that. Now we could try to, now since we're interested in the ERI and in the interaction between uh, distributions rather than points, uh, we could try to apply the same kind of method, but we're not going to be successful, um, not immediately, unless we make some important changes. So here's what happens if we try to use a proxy surface method for charge distributions. We have these uh, distributions that are um, separated, but, but the extents can still overlap, which will give us a poor approximation. So the extents of these red points could overlap with the extents of the blue points. Okay, so instead what we're going to do is we're going to split the uh, columns of that matrix that we want to approximate. So if this is that matrix that we want to approximate, we're going to split the columns into two sets. The first set is um, J near, another set is J far, and J near is the set of, of um, a set of distributions with overlapping extents with our extents in our central box. So there's not much we can do about that. We just have to uh, bite the bullet and, and do an approximation, do an appro low rank approximation there using algebraic techniques. And then for the J far, that's where we're able to um, use something that's more like the proxy surface method. Okay. Um, the number of these distributions in J near is still going to be order one compared to uh, for each problem size. So this is what allows us to keep the complexity of the method uh, manageable. Okay, so, so how do we choose the proxy points? Instead of choosing the proxy points on one surface, we have to choose the proxy points in, in a domain. Okay, and these are, instead of having distributions, approximating distributions with distributions, we're approximating distributions with a set of points spread out in a domain. Okay, so this ultimately gives us this algorithm. Okay, so, so if we want to compute the approximation for this ERI matrix block, okay, the inputs are the geometries of our block, our, of our box and the outputs are the um, this matrix U and this uh, subset of points IID. And with those, we can get the, the low rank approximation. So the first thing is to geometrically split into J near and J far. We select the proxy point charges. And then we also use randomized algorithms to try to do a pre-compression in a sense. In other words, we don't have to deal with the original matrices. Uh, so this is the this is the J near part. This is the J far part. So it's the interaction between points in our box with our proxy points. Okay, and interestingly, this interaction is an interaction between continuous distributions and points. So it looks more like a nuclear attraction integral, which is a lot cheaper to compute than, than ERIs. Okay, so we put together these two approximations we can apply an algebraic approximation just like in the proxy surface method. And then from that, we can get the U for our approximation to the entire block. Okay, so uh, let me show you some test results of some test calculations. So first of all, we want to test to make sure that the method is accurate. So as accurate as any other method we would want to use. So this method we're calling H2ERI. We're going to compare using that and density fitting in uh, Hartree-Fock and DFT calculations, ground state calculations. Okay. Um, we're going to use two basis sets. One is a augmented or dif more diffuse basis set. So that's going to be very interesting to see what effect that has. And I'm using a machine with 1.5 terabytes of memory. So that's quite a bit of memory. So that's giving a lot of advantages to uh, density fitting, which will use more memory, but we wanted to see at least if everything could be stored in memory, what the timings would look like. But um, if you don't have this much memory, then, um, then the density fitting approach will be quite expensive. 
um, and the ER, H2 ERI method would be much more effective. Okay, so we're using GTFOC. Um, so GTFOC has codes for Hartree FOC and, and for density fitting, and it, it has a very efficient density fitting code that takes advantage of symmetry and sparsity. We're using cement to compute the integrals. And here's another advantage for density fitting because cement, which computes the integrals efficiently using SIMD uh, operations is very efficient when we have uh, three centered integrals. And uh, the H2 calculations are done using a, a new package that we have called H2PAC. Okay, so here's um, what the errors look like for a set of systems, uh, you know, linear chains, uh, sheets, and then these protein ligand systems that are more, more globular. So there's their protein or truncated protein uh, with a ligand. Okay, so these are the errors and you can see that for the same, um, so this is for hartree you can so, so you can see that these are the errors that we, that we get, oh, H2 ERI is getting lower errors for the particular calculations that I'm showing you. And um, this, these are the corresponding computation time and storage. Okay, so paying attention to the storage first, um, this is the storage required for density fitting, and this is the storage required for H2 ERI. And these are quantities in gigabytes. Okay, so you can see that there's quite a bit of reduction in the storage that is needed. So it could be factors of 10 and uh, very large uh, differences also in the augmented case where, where things can uh, overlap a lot more. Okay, one difference is that in, so, so also the computation of the Coulomb matrix is much smaller, but one difference is that we need a pre-computation, which is the time needed to compute the um, to compute the the um, H two representation in the first place, and this is the expensive part. Okay, um, so it's not really going to make up for the decrease in time in the J matrix, but it can very well make up for that if the uh, ERI tensor cannot be. The, the density fitting tensors cannot be stored in memory. And here's uh, what scaling looks like. Okay, so uh, the blue curves are scaling for the H2 door hierarchical methods, and they're very close to one. So these are the slopes, so very close to linear scaling, whereas the other methods are much closer to, uh, to quadratic scaling. So this is for execution time, and this is for storage. And then a comparison with, with a CFMM. So we didn't do calculations with CFMM, but it is easy to estimate the number of uh, near field and far field blocks. And this is the improvement in, um, that we have in the hierarchical matrix approach. In, for, for these linear chains, the improvement is not as high because CFMM is already doing a very good job. But for the more globular and uh, for, for things that are not linear chains, we have a much better improvement. And in particular, when we're using these diffuse spaces sets, we, have, we can get a very large improvement compared to CFMN. Okay, so in conclusion, um, this new method is an approach that leads to very modest storage requirements. And it allows us to store the ERI, essentially store the ERI and therefore not have to recompute um, recompute re integrals. It does have a high pre-computation cost, but the pre-computation cost is less than the cost of directly forming the Coulomb matrix once, meaning direct calculation of the, of the ERIs using all of the symmetry and, um, and screening and all of those good things. So, so less than the cost of that. So, um, so since it's an HPC type of uh, discussion for larger problems, this type of algorithm uh, will probably be much better than what is out there right now, especially uh, CFMM, which would be the direct competitor. All right, so thank you very much.
Thank you, Admon, for the talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, Volker, do you have a question? I'm mainly, I'm mainly applauding. I'm great talk. Um, I'm yes. Yeah. So that so my 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 question was not a question but applause. So the one thing that I'm still uh, trying to figure out is how they and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm just slow is how they how the methods ERI your, your versus H two differ conceptually in the sense what is the limit of ERI that H two doesn't have. But but I'm, I think I'm just too slow. Yeah. yeah so very impressive. Yeah. So comparative density fitting instead of approximating the ERI matrix with one low rec approximation. It's using something like local density fitting. And compared to continuous fast multiple method, um, all of these interactions between boxes that are nearby that cannot be compressed using multiple expansions, we use using this hybrid algebraic analytic method that gives us the Approximation. So these can be stored in low rank form. So everything just compresses by these very large factors as shown by the numerical results. Thanks, Walker. Edgar, did you raise your hand at some point? Uh, I meant to just applaud. Uh, I thought that was a great result. Oh, Thanks. okay. Yes, it is. Yeah, actually, I have a question myself. So uh, you mentioned that in the context of HPC, uh, your approach is going to be uh, even more competitive. Uh, but what if you use distributed memory to reduce the memory cost of the traditional method? Because yes. it looks faster, and if memory is not a problem, uh, kind yeah. of problem. so. Um... So you could try to use distributed memory for density fitting. Mm -hmm. um, you face two problems. One is that the memory required for density fitting increases so fast that you even run out of memory on very large distributed machines, even the largest. Like at okay. one point, I thought, maybe that, well, I thought exactly the same thing. The other is that as you increase the, as you increase the problem size, the direct method is going to start to uh, because of sparsity, the direct method is going to be, be better than density fitting. So at, at some point, the direct method is going to be better. And then this method is always going to be better than, than direct. So there is, you know, um, you know I, I should have shown you some examples that did not fit in the 1.2 terabytes of memory that we had. And in those cases, you know, we would have to either recompute ERIs or, or you know, recompute the tensors, whatever. So um, that's the main advantage for, for HPC looking at larger problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, 